Okay, you can turn in your Bible, King James Bible, to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. We're going to start an expository study. Uh, what can we as Christians get from the book of Revelation? Bible-believing Christians. That's important to understand. Not uh, referring to Greek and Hebrew original autographs that don't exist. All right, as the only infallible Word of God. Now, we believe that this King James Bible is God's perfect Word. So, let's start out here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Um, does Jesus Christ need to be revealed to us as Christians? No. Why is he showing his servants there? God gave them to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. See, we're looking at the thing as Christians and we can go, wow, we can see, you know, all these different banks and stuff are starting to go to biometric types of finger scanning, iris scanning. Um, people are implanting microchips, you know, biohacking, they call it. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, I want to make a comment here and, it, and I was going to do a special video just on this but I'll, I'll put it into this one it used to be years ago when they'd come out with this whole thing of scannable microchips and whatever the mainstream media would make comments about well some people say it could it's like the book of revelation the mark of the beast thing and well some say yes and some they would mention it now they don't even mention the mark of the beast anymore see they're acclimating people they're getting people ready so it's very interesting but um Jesus Christ is going to be revealed. To who? What's the purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble? Jesus is going to be revealed to the Jews. We're going to see that in this first chapter of Revelation. Pretty interesting. But it's just neat to be able to say, as Christians, we are God's servants, and He is showing us things which must shortly come to pass. We aren't looking and saying, well, yeah, the, books, the book of Revelation is just so, it's futuristic, it's way out there, we, I can't even understand it. As we get closer to that time, we can really see a lot of these things coming to pass. Interesting. Verse 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus and of all things that he saw. Remember, it's talking to there in uh, verse 1, sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now, it's very interesting because those three things are going to happen in your life as a Christian. You say, what three things? Number one, you will bear record of the word of God. Absolutely. We're going to see some scriptures on this. You will have the testimony of Jesus Christ and you will testify there of uh, all things that he saw. You will be an eyewitness of many things, of miraculous type of things that are going to happen in your life. You're going to say, that couldn't have been anything but the Lord doing that. You know, you studied through the whole Bible, the whole King James Bible. The word coincidence does not show up even one time. Conspiracy does. Uh, many times. Very interesting. Uh, there is no such thing as coincidence in your life. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Everything is part of God's plan in your life as a Christian. There are no coincidences. So we can say, hey, we've seen some things in our life since we've gotten saved. But let's look here. John chapter 14, 23, verse 23. Not chapter 1,423, mind you. Chapter 14, 23. What about bearing record of the word of God? We read there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. It says here, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In other words, this book, you'll see things that go on in here happening in your own life. As a saved Christian, you will bear record of the Word of God. You'll say, somebody comes along and they say, oh, that book's so outdated, it's just ridiculous. You say, let me tell you something, the book's not outdated. And it's not ridiculous. I've seen application of this book in my own life. Absolutely. What about having the testimony of Jesus Christ? Turn back to John 3. John chapter 3, verse 18. It 
John chapter 3, verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the, the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Very interesting, because as a Christian, the testimony of Jesus Christ was, as Jesus was walking around on the earth, there were people that were in darkness that hated him because he was light, and he was shining his, the light of truth upon their deeds of evil, their dark deeds of evil. You're going to have that same thing, Christian. If you haven't experienced it yet, if you're newly saved, you will experience it at some point in time, that there are people that don't like to be around you. You're a goody two-shoes, or you're judging, or something like this, narrow-minded, narrow bigoted, you know, whatever. They'll come up with these little terms for you. Why? Because you're bringing conviction into their life. See, they're working hard to kill their conscience to say, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. And you come along and you say, hey, you know what, what you're doing there is wrong. That's sin. They don't like that sin word. Not at all. You will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You will be like a light in this very dark world. Again, another tie-in to Revelation 1 verse 2. And what about the thing of seeing many things? Same book, John, chapter 21. John chapter 21, verse 24 and 25, it says, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Interesting there. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Can you say that as a Christian? I mean, the old song, the old hymn goes, Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Name, you know, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Do you ever stop to think of how many times the Lord has blessed you and protected you and answered your prayers? A lot. <laughs> I mean, if you wrote down everything that the Lord's done in your life, every time that you've witnessed Him doing something, guiding you, directing you, protecting you, whatever, you know, even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. <laughs> yeah. You will be, as it says here in Revelation 1 verse 2, and of all the things that He saw, you will see God working in your life. I'll give you a good example. Just the other day, I was um, out, side and things and, and uh, I had taken my keys out of my pocket I was doing some some building and things and uh, working outside and I have a little Leatherman tool that has a pliers on it and I take it out to, to pull a staple out of a board and I just took my keys my keychain with my Leatherman tool and I stuck it in the pocket of my tool belt and I forgot about it and I put my tool belt inside the shed and I was going to shut the door and lock it. And it was just like I had the lock in the thing. I was about to press it. And it was like in my head it went, I heard this like, what about your keys? And I was like, put my hand down in my pocket. Oh, my keys aren't, oh, that's right there in the tool belt. I mean, I was that close <laughs> to locking my keys inside of the building. And the only way into the building is with the keys that are in the building. <laughs> you know, it would have been a big problem. All right. And uh, I was very far away from an extra set of keys. So it would have been a major problem. But uh, what was that? Was the Lord telling me about that. Just little simple things like that. Little times that just like the Lord's blessed us and, and, and I've seen Him working in my life. And you'll see that as a Christian. So right there in verse 2, you'll see those three things in your life when you truly get saved. You will have, you'll bear record of the Word of God. You'll say, hey, yeah, the, the book's true. I've seen the application of it in my own life. You'll have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You will be a light in a dark world. And you will have many times when you've seen, you're an eyewitness to God working supernaturally in your life. You'll see it. And, you know, we get so, you know, to the point where we don't even give God glory a lot of times for little things that He's done. You know, you go to the store and something's on sale, and you go, wow, I didn't know that, that was going to be on sale. Give God glory for that. You say, well, is the people that 
who do you think could influence those people? You walk out in the parking lot and, and there's some coins or there's a $20 bill laying there. You pick it up, there's no one around that is looking for it. You go, wow, thank you, Lord, you know. Uh, all kinds of things, all kinds of things. You get sick, you get a bad headache, you know, and you pray about it, and a little while later the headache's gone. Give God, you know, glory. Give Him thanks for that. And those are all things that you've seen where you've seen the Lord working in your life. Pretty neat. Now let's look at verse 3, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Here it says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Okay? Two things. Number one, you will get a spiritual blessing from reading the book of Revelation. That's, again, another reason why I decided to do this study. Um, there are great blessings that come from just reading the book of Revelation. It's a, it's a terrible time that's coming that's described in this book, but it ends very, very well for us as Christians. I mean, we're going to be leaving before these events take place. But uh, it's horrible things that are going to happen on this earth. But boy, when we come back, it's going to be something else. But this thing of keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. How do you keep the things that are written therein? Well, uh, first of all, by not giving up on the book, by not being ashamed of God's word. His written word. That's one way to keep it. The other way is to live it. All right? So you don't quit and you live accordingly. All right? You are kind of a law-abiding Christian, so to speak, in terms of you read the Bible and you go with what the Bible says there. It's, in, it's your instruction book for living in this, in this life or earth. <laughs> kind of combine my two words there. But let's go to verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. All right. Um, now here's part of the debate thing that comes in. Who are these seven churches? Now there's a lot of back and forth on this thing. We're going to be looking at the seven churches from, from uh, chapters 2 and 3. It goes into the seven churches and talks a little bit about them. And there's definitely some great instruction in righteousness there. Uh, but some people will say, well, the seven churches are seven local churches. And I say local, you know, because of that term has been perverted now to mean buildings. <laughs> but uh, seven churches in, in local areas and, you know, they're groups of people. Uh, well, that's true. But people also say, well, it represents seven periods in church history or seven types of churches or seven types of Christians or... There's even some that say seven churches in the in the time of Jacob's trouble. Because church just means a called out assembly. So, you know, the body of Christ leaves, but there will still be, you know, there will be people that get saved after the body of Christ leaves. And if they are meeting together, technically they are a church. So, uh, it can go a lot of different ways. But we're going to see, again, I'm not going to be getting into this thing from a real deep doctrinal standpoint and things because there's good arguments for a lot of the different things and a lot of it I think is just a mystery that's not going to be revealed to us as Christians today but we're going to look at it for instruction in righteousness but that's the first point there with verse 4 um, secondly it's kind of interesting because you have three witches there <laughs> spelled differently than a W-I-T-C-H but look at it which is and which was and which is to come. Uh, you can only say that about an eternal being. He is, present tense, Jesus Christ is alive. He is in control of things. Which was, in other words, he came in the past. He was there from the very beginning. And which is to come, he's coming back. Okay, um, can you say that about Buddha? Is he still alive right now? Which is? No. Which was? Well, yeah, he, he was alive at one point in time. Which is to come? No, he's not coming back. How about Muhammad? Nope. 
any other leader or founder of any other you know system of religious belief out there can any of them can you say that about anybody else nope only jesus pretty interesting but what about the thing of the seven spirits which are before his throne let's look about that keep your hand there in revelation chapter one and we'll go back to the book of isaiah in your old testament Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2. It says here, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You say, what was the first one there? The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay? Sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> Seven spirits in verse 2. Is that the seven spirits that are there before his throne in Revelation chapter 1? Well, I think it is. It's kind of interesting. A lot of people, you might not have known about the thing of the seven spirits of God. And you say, explain that to me. I can't. I don't know. I just believe it, you know. Um, you say, well, you should be smart enough to figure it out. Uh, if I figured out God with my own intellect, um, he wouldn't be any more intelligent than me. And he certainly wouldn't be worth worshiping then at that point in time. So uh, there's a lot about the, you know, the Godhead, a lot about this book. Like I said, I'm just, I don't know. I just read it and believe it. But let's go to verse 5 now, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's a very important one. If you haven't seen this before, I'll show it to you real quickly here. Go back to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says here, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross was God's blood. It wasn't man's blood. You know, and John MacArthur, years and years ago, I've said about this before, but he came out and he Oh, you know, the blood that Jesus shed was really not that important. I mean, he could have just been strangled. It would have meant the same thing. It was his death, uh, showing his ignorance of Scripture. And, you know, he's kind of backpedaled a little bit. And, and people say, well, he, he kind of took that back. And he, he didn't really mean that. And, mm -hmm. Just came out and showed himself to be a heretic. Okay, if you deny the blood of Jesus Christ, you got some problems. And part of the reason he did that, if you want to go to Colossians chapter 1, Part of the reason that uh, John MacArthur denied the blood of Jesus Christ is because he's connected to a lot of these new versions that come from the Vatican. Yeah, Colossians 1 for, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you have an NIV or a lot of these other new versions, they take out through his blood. Kind of weird why they would take out the blood. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, go back to Revelation. We'll go to chapter 7. I'm going to show you the very important significance of this thing of... It says there in verse 5, Washed us from our sins in His own blood. Jesus washed us. Okay? Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 says... And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, now watch this, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wait a second. Washed us from our sins in his own blood unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, in Revelation chapter 1, you have people that are washed by Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 7, they are washing themselves. What's going on there? Well, there's an element of works that enters into the time of Jacob's trouble for salvation. You can't take the mark. See? What is there like that today as a Christian? There isn't anything. When you come to Jesus Christ for salvation, you get washed in the blood. And He'll wash your sins away. And by the way, it's up to Him to decide who gets saved and who's lost. I'm not talking about Calvinistic predestination or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, there are a lot of people that come to Jesus Christ and say, I'm here to be saved, and they pray some prayer and whatever else. But God looks on the heart. God looks and says, if there's some kind of a thing there where they're not truly you know, done with their self-righteousness, they're just you know, saying this prayer, and it's just they're caught up in the emotion of the moment and whatever else. If that's the case, he's not going to save them. Right? He's not going to wash them in his own blood. Uh, they're not broken enough. And I've seen that thing. People with their pride and they just pray a prayer and then they go on living like the devil and they've, oh, I'm a Christian, you know, and stuff. It's bad. But let's, uh, and then by the way, this is how you know that the people, the saints in uh, Revelation chapter 7 are not Christians like we are today. Uh, they're not, they're washing their own robes. We're washed in the blood. And the other thing is, there's a difference between Gentiles verses 9 down through there, and uh, verse 4 down through 8. Those are Jews. But yet today, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, according to the book of Galatians. So, many proofs that uh, Christians are not there in that time of Jacob's trouble. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to go to verse 6. Revelation 1 verse 6 says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right. We are going to reign with Jesus Christ. Again, chapter 1 is clearly being written to Christians today. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because I forgot to make a mention of this, but uh, up there in verse, uh, what was it, verse 2, there about who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Um, very interesting because who was, you know, the, the, the verses that we read, uh, where were they from? The book of John. Who was John? The disciple whom Jesus loved. I thought that was kind of interesting. But what about this thing of reigning with Jesus Christ? Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, says here, It is a faithful saying, For if, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So the denial there in verse 12 is, If you don't suffer as a Christian, you're not going to reign with him in the millennial kingdom. All right? Uh, he's not denying you in the sense of you're not saved, you're, you're done, or something like that. How do you know that? Because in verse 13, he cannot deny himself. All right? He's faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him, in other words. Kind of a convicting thing there, isn't it? But go back to Revelation chapter 1. I'll look at verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, what is being referred to here? This is kind of an interesting thing. Zechariah chapter 12. If you want to keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 1, we can go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9 through 14 is where we're going to read. Back to Revelation 1. Um, they also which pierced him. Okay? Let's read about that. 
Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. Look at this. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Time of Jacob's trouble. You see? Do you understand? This is for a time where Jesus Christ is going to be revealed to the nation of Israel. Such a neat tie-in. I mean, it's just it's so amazing. And they're going to look upon Jesus, who they, the nation of Israel, have pierced. They're going to look and say, we rejected our Messiah. I mean, do you realize, that what is the theme of the whole Bible? The theme of the whole Bible is God's dealing with man through Jesus Christ. That's what the theme of the whole Bible is. It's very interesting. Back to Zechariah chapter 12 here. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that be in, is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart the family of Shimei apart and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. So, uh, what's going on here in Zechariah chapter 12 is what we read about here in uh, verse 7 of Revelation chapter 1. Again, seeing that John writing to Christians here, but yet he says, hey, the time's going to come. He's explaining the second coming. And he's saying, that time is for the Jews, essentially, is what he's trying to get through there. He's referring back to what's going on in Zechariah chapter 12. I mean, do Christians need to be here on the earth and say, oh, we're the ones that pierced him. We, we rejected him as our Messiah. Uh, he didn't come to be the Messiah to the Gentiles. He's our Savior, sure, but he's not our Messiah. The Messiah is a uniquely Jewish thing. But let's continue. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. There we see the three witches again. You know, But notice the unique statement of an eternal being. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Hmm. In other words, uh, Jesus Christ is eternity. He represents eternity. That's why people say, well, I just can't believe that Jesus would burn people forever in hell. But Jesus is eternity. He is forever. So if you've offended a holy, righteous God, you're going to pay as long as He's alive. You're going to pay for your sins. And if you have accepted Him and received Him as your Savior, as your Lord... You're going to be with him as long as he's alive. Forever. The beginning and the end. Pretty neat. And pretty scary, too, if you're lost. If you're lost, uh, you better get saved. Most important decision that you can make. Let me just show you this, too, by the way. This thing of Jesus being eternity. Keep your hand in Revelation chapter 1 again. Go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It says here, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's an amazing verse. I mean, you want to talk about a very profound verse in your New Testament. By Jesus Christ, all things consist. Everything is tied to Jesus Christ. It's really kind of ironic because you get all these people down here on the earth, all these atheists and whoever else, Satanists and things, and they hate Jesus. And they'll mock Jesus and everything else. Oh, you know, yeah. And they'll say a bunch of nasty stuff. And it's like they got a lifeline plugging themselves into Jesus Christ and he's keeping them life. 
or excuse me, he's keeping them alive. He's giving them life. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, it's like you're on life support and, you, and you're like, you know, that stupid machine over here. What was this dumb thing doing you? It's keeping you alive, right? If you're lost, Jesus Christ is your life support. And if you get to the point where you make him mad enough, he might just uh, pull the plug on your life. You might want to get saved. Yeah. Verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Look at this. This is interesting. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hmm. So John was in you know, basically exiled to an island. Why? Because he was a hate criminal? No. Because he actually robbed a bank or something like this and got caught? No. He was there because of what? The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And by the way, uh, you say, well, the Bible's not that important. We have the, the testimony and things. You wouldn't know Jesus if it wasn't for this book. Okay? This book tells you about Jesus. So don't come along and tell me that the Bible version issue is not important or what Bible you use or the Bible itself, you don't even really need it and things. You're kidding yourself. All right? It's very important. But uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 18, or excuse me, 13, verse 18. Matthew chapter 13. I'll show you this thing here. Matthew 13, verse 18 through 21. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, that then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which uh, received seed by the wayside. Or in the book of Mark, it, the wicked one is actually named as Satan comes and takes away the word that's sown in their heart. Verse 20, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no, not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Interesting. Uh, one of the marks of a false convert is they will have a very poor attitude towards this book. They won't really respect the word of God. And they'll be a Christian until all of a sudden it gets very unpopular to stand for the Bible. And then all of a sudden, well, well I, I once was a Christian. Now I'm an atheist or something. Yeah, sure, right. You were never a Christian. These people that hate the Word of God and things. But uh, you can relate. If you're truly saved, you can understand some of what John was going through. And you think to yourself, somebody comes along and says, you know, if you don't shut your mouth about this Bible, you might end up in prison. And you kind of think to yourself, well, whatever you want to do to me or whatever you want to say to me or whatever else will threaten me, whatever, I can't turn against this book. Just as simple as that. This book has changed me. This book is, is the center of all truth. Would you be willing to be exiled to an island? It's kind of rough. But... Uh, Mark of a true convert is how they feel about this book, the Word of God. But let's look at verse 10. It says here, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay, now I've talked about this thing before. Uh, the word trump in your King James Bible appears two times. Both are in reference to God's voice. Trump is the sound that a trumpet makes. It is not a trumpet. Okay? And both times you hear when God speaks to a saved individual. Over in John chapter 10, Jesus talks about speaking to his sheep and things. He calls them by name. So when the Lord speaks to his people, his you know, saved people, to Christians, um, you will hear his voice and it will sound like a trumpet talking with you. 
it's a certain melodious uh, musical type of tone I imagine again I you say play a recording of it well I can't <laughs> you know I don't understand exactly how it's going to work out but it's going to sound like a musical type of a voice like a trumpet and it's ironic because 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are the only two places where the word trump appears both places refer to the rapture not the second coming and we're going to, if you turn over to chapter 4, we're not going to today here in Revelation, but John hears a voice that sounds like a trumpet talking with him. Same thing here in verse 10 of chapter 1. A very interesting thing there. Verse 11, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11 through 14, we'll read that saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the, the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, <laughs> there is a this new movement out there that Jesus was actually a black man and things, and the disciples were all black as well, and and uh, they weren't really Shemitic; they were Ham, you know, Hamites, essentially. Um, and it's replacement theology, just a different variety of it. Instead of the white Europeans being the true Jews, now it's black Africans that are the true Jews. Very, very weird stuff. But they will use this verse here, verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. And they say, well, see, wool is kind of a kinky, kind of somewhat curly in things like a black person's hair. And they're, they're the ones saying this. I'm not being racist or something else. They're the ones saying this. They're the ones putting this out. Um, and they say, see, so... Jesus Christ had black man's hair, and it's white in color, but it's still it's like the hair of a black man, proving that he was black. <laughs> it's like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Look at the text. His hairs were white like wool. Does it say his hair was kinky and kind of, and you know, had the texture of, of wool? No, it was white. It's describing the collar. How do you know that? Collar, collar, however you say the word. I get people, what is it? Collar? <laughs> it's my you know, weird accent that I have being from southeastern Pennsylvania. He's describing the collar of the hair. Okay, how do you know that? Keep reading. White like wool, as white as snow. Now, Jesus didn't, he didn't have a snow cone on top of his head either or something, okay? It's describing the collar. It is not describing the texture of the hair. So when people come and try to say, see, Jesus was a black man because right there, another proof. And here's another one that they'll use, verse 15. You can just scratch him out as being ridiculous. Verse 15, And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as... Uh, the sun shineth in his strength. Okay? Now, what is this thing of the sword there? A sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What is that about? Well, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 talks about the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Very interesting. But the real good one, if you don't know your Bible that well, I'll show you here. Revelation chapter 19 about this thing of the sword coming out of his mouth, out of the Lord's mouth. Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 through 21, says here, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Here we go. 
which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You know what the most powerful weapon in the universe is? The double-edged sword of uh, God's Word. The sword that comes out of the Lord's mouth. The sword of the Spirit. This is the most powerful weapon in the entire universe. Very interesting. And by the way, if you say, well, what's the deal about this, uh, you know, this army and things? Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 9, I'll show you real quickly here. Revelation chapter 9, verse 16. Speaking of this army that gets wiped out with the sword of the mouth, that, that comes out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. So, Basically, there you have this huge Antichrist army, and they're wiped out by the spoken word of the Lord Jesus Christ. You better, better be real careful cutting on this book, making fun of the King James Bible. All right, verse 17, Revelation chapter 1, back there. It says here, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. Um, who wrote the book of Revelation? Who was it revealed to? John. Um, what was John doing there in uh, chapter 13, verse 23? John chapter 13, verse 23. Let's turn there quick. John chapter 13, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So when Jesus is here on the earth, John is kind of leaning, you know, like this, just kind of reclining back with his head kind of here on the Lord. And yet when John sees him as the resurrected Christ, he's falling at his feet as though he were dead. Again, you know, you see these these pictures and these paintings and stuff, artist renditions of Christians that go to see Jesus, and it's like, hey, you know, we hug each other, you know, and Jesus is hugging them and warmly and everything. Um, no, that was the Lamb. See, John, when he had his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ, that was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was meek, mild, and lowly, but he's not coming back that way. I mean, you you know, you can see that somebody with a, a, a lamb and they can kind of cuddle with the lamb and lamb will lick their face nice, you know, real lightly and they're very cute and very tender and whatever else. But uh, you don't often see that with a wild lion. Let me just go over and kind of put my head on the lion's bosom, you know, and just kind of, you know. Mm -mm. That's why John, when he sees Jesus Christ there, he falls at his feet as dead. The disciple whom Jesus loved. You see, you need to have a proper respect for Jesus Christ as a Christian. You can't just say, well, Jesus is my buddy, he's my homeboy, or some kind of wicked thing like that. We need to remember who we're dealing with. We are dealing with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I mean, would you just, you know, some king or something, uh, uh, I don't even know, it's a queen yet over there in England, but uh, the, the very highest king in the world or whatever, and uh, you just kind of walk in and you got dirt on your shoes and you track it across the carpet and you kind of sit down in his chair and you go, hey, King, what's going on? Whack, hit him in the chest. How you doing, buddy? You don't act that way to a king. Okay? And what am I saying? Well, I'm saying that as a Christian, when you start to get a little bit too familiar to the Lord or with the Lord and you start to kind of say, ah, you know, just, the Lord doesn't care about that stuff, you know, I can just, you know, do this and whatever else. You're starting to forget who he is. And you're starting to forget the fact that it's not going to be the lamb that judges us at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be the lion. I believe that. Jesus Christ as the king. You know, we're going to be bowing the knee and taking the knee before our king when we get there to heaven. I mean, I think it'd be a wonderful thing when we get up there, the rapture happens, we meet the Lord in the air. Wouldn't it be neat if we get there? And we first of all we see the saints and we're having a hey 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 and everything else you know, wow we we it's we're finally here we've made it 
And all of a sudden we look and we see Jesus Christ and the whole body of Christ just goes and bows down before our King. That'd be wonderful. You read about the 24 elders taking their crowns off and throwing them before the throne. Mm -hmm. Pretty convicting. Oh, it doesn't hurt if I just do this or do that. Because Jesus, I know Jesus, we're good buddies. Is he your king? Something to think about. Verse 18. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus controls who goes to hell. And he controls when you die. And I've seen this thing many times where the Lord will let wicked people just go and go and go and go and go and finally, boom, he kills them, lets them be killed, and then they go to hell. Interesting. But uh, I want to make another very important statement here about this verse. Verse uh, 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. Okay? You get a Jehovah's, come to the, Jehovah's Witness come to the door. Hello, we're Christians. We want to talk to you about our Watchtower magazine here. We have a free copy for you, and we'd like you to join our call, uh, uh, church. <laughs> you, want a, you want a very good way to, uh, to uh, answer one of these Jehovah's Witnesses, a good question, I should say. What you do is you say, um, see what verse here, verse 8, all right? Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. All right. Ask a Jehovah's Witness, who is that referring to? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Most of them will say, well, it's, that's the Lord there. It's, it's God. So is that Jehovah God right there? Yes. Yes, I believe so. Okay, then you go over to verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. Uh, when did God die? They don't believe he did. You know, They believe Jesus was just you know, Michael the archangel or something like this. And, you know, uh, He wasn't really God manifest in the flesh. So, why is it in the same context here? One minute he's saying that he's the beginning and the end. And then he says... I am he which liveth and was dead. You can get him good on that one. <laughs> of course, they, you know, they try to weasel out of it and whatever else, but pretty interesting. But let's look at the last two verses here. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay. Now, what can we get out of that? Well, a very interesting thing. What are the stars in heaven? Angels, according to the Bible. Pretty interesting. Say, oh no, oh brother, this is, you know, this poor dumb Christian preacher. He's just so dumb. You know, we've in science we've proved that uh, stars are gaseous balls of matter. They're burning. Uh, well, that's what you've seen with your test, your, your your telescope. But have you actually been there to test the surface of those suns? I mean, for the people that say that that's what it is, um, do you really know that for sure? I mean, have you gone and actually tested what these stars are composed of? No, they haven't. So you can't really scientifically prove that I'm wrong. And the Bible over and over again compares stars to angels. So, just thought that was interesting. You know, and again, a uh, little couple of nights ago, Went outside, and uh, it was a really nice starlit night, and um, you could see this one star, and it was really kind of glimmering and shining, and 
I said to my wife, I said, isn't that amazing? You know, that star over there, that's an angel. And you know, our connection to God is just right there. You can see it, the supernatural realm. If you believe the Bible for what it says, stars are angels, according to this book. Very interesting. So, I can say a lot more. Um, I apologize. I'm I'm kind of kind of a little bit tired right now. Um, hopefully, I didn't say anything, you know, really weird. <laughs> but uh, much study is a weariness to the flesh. Uh, I did this research away from being in town here, and and uh, the study went very well. But uh, I'll tell you what, it's just putting together sermons is not always easy. Uh, definitely can be very, very challenging at times. <sighs> but I just want to encourage you out there um, as Christians, you know, to, to remember that we have an authority in the Word of God, to remember that um, the Lord's plans for the future include us and include some really, really amazing precious promises for us as Christians. Um, and if you're not saved, I pray that you would get saved uh, as soon as you can. Uh, don't put it off. Don't delay. Because the day is going to come when you're not going to want, you know, the Christian or the salvation if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Because salvation in that time means you're going to be an enemy of the state. And actually not just state. I'm talking world government. So... Um, that is going to be it for this study. I have some more stuff to get done here, so uh, please keep us in your prayers. I'm not going to close with a word of prayer today because I'm just kind of... Uh, a lot of this stuff is supernatural. You know, I'm convinced of that. There are many times when I'm just... I'm going along, I'm doing fine. I had plenty of sleep, you know, and I'm... You know, good food to eat, whatever else, and I'm just... All of a sudden it just hits me and I'm just going... Ugh. I'm going to fall asleep. Um... The devil's not happy with us. All right. If you're a Bible believing Christian, the devil doesn't like you very much. So, but anyways, please pray for us. I'm going to be, like I said in the introduction video, not sure how often these Revelation expository studies are going to be done. Um, I don't know if it's going to be weekly or not. I don't, I have no idea. But uh, we will get to them as we can. And um, I guess that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.